Wynne Willard, a Massachusetts native born in Cambridge in 1946, I'm not going to say the date, uh, raised in Plymouth and Cape Cod where he gained his love and experience with boats. Co-founder of Hunt Yachts and vice president of Hunt Associates, Wynne is a graduate of Babson College with a degree in business administration and economics. Wynne studied naval architecture at the University of Michigan, is a member of the Society of Naval Architects and Marine Engineers, and has been with Hunt Design since 1970. His design experience spans a range of small boats from 20-foot day sailors to 120-foot motor yachts. Is that the one, James, that you bought? <laughs> Patrol boats for the U.S. Navy, fire boats and police boats for New York City, pilot boats for every major port in the United States, jet skis and airboats. Jet skis is probably what James did buy. All of it with his colleagues at Hunt Yacht Design in New Bedford. Wynn lives in South Dartmouth, Carolyn, married for 37 years. They enjoy cruising their Cal 28, a Hunt Design, of course, around the Bay and Islands. His second passion is baseball. He plays with the Rhode Island men's over 50 league, or as Carolyn calls it, geezer ball. <laughs> no, nah, he's not, not even close to being a geezer. Not even. Anyway, it's my pleasure to introduce Wynn Willard to speak to us tonight. Good evening. It's quite an intimidating group. <laughs> um, thank you, John. Thank you, Jim. Um, while we could discuss baseball, that's probably not what you came here to hear about. So I'm, I'm here tonight really to tell you a little about Ray Hunt and his designs. Um, as you will see, Ray was prolific and frenetic, and so to wrap up his career in an hour or so is not a very easy task. And I know there's a lot of the Hunt family here tonight, and a lot of friends. In fact, there's probably half of you probably know Ray as well as I did or better. So I'm, I'm not going to talk about the man as much as I'm going to talk mostly about his designs and his legacy as a designer. A, a more definitive work on this subject is in process. Mark uh, Kellogg is here somewhere, and he is he's writing a book about writing a biography about Ray. Uh, we got soon, right, Mark? So fun. So thanks, and thank I want to thank everybody, the family, particularly the friends who uh, got me a bunch of photos that you'll see tonight, and some information and anecdotes. Um, and uh, I need to thank especially Serena Rousseau. I don't know if Serena's made it. She's our office manager and uh, the gal who keeps us all on track. She put a, helped me put all of this together. But she has two little ones to take care of, so she may not have made it. Over the course of my career, um, I've had the privilege of meeting uh, several of the premier designers of our time. Uh, Philip Rhodes, Olin Stevens, Jack Hargrave, a, a lot. Dan Savitsky. Um, well, you may not know that last name, but um, in the field of powerboat design, he's practically known as Saint Savitsky. Uh, we'll get back to him a bit later on. But all of them were giants in the field, for sure. But in my estimation, Ray's contribution to small boat design exceeds them all. This is Ray. This is a sort of an iconic photograph largely because we don't have a lot of good ones of Ray, although thanks to the family I've got a few more. C. Raymond Hunt, known as Ray. Um, it was always Ray. C stands for Charles, but it was never Charles, Charlie, or Chuck. It was always Ray. Now where's my little clicker? There it is, thank you. Okay. Ray Hunt, he, he is the only designer that I'm aware of whose designs won championships in both power and sail. Uh, here you have uh, Brave Moppy, which Dick Bertram won the World Powerboat Championship with in 1965. And that's Ray right there. Oops, I'm going to go back. Sorry. That's Ray there, and he said his back was never the same after that boat ride. <laughs> and you see, the, the real guys up there have the helmets on. Because otherwise, it's sort of tears in your ears in those kind of boat rides. Um, and that's, a, that's an old race boat. That boat was good for about 40 knots. That was about it. Eventually, that boat sank in a race, and the engines went right through the bottom. 
the wooden boat. It had uh, twin 671s um, and one rudder and, uh, to cut the drag down. And they, when they'd lose one engine, the boat would only go in circles one way. <laughs> um, this boat here, this lovely little sailboat, is called Kaya 2. It's a five and a half meter design that Ray came up with in 1963. And Ray, well, it's a story we'll get to later on, but Ray won the world championships in that boat. Quite versatile, this man. Hello, there we go. Okay, well, that's pretty exciting, isn't it? Uh, th that's down the street from here. Um, and his name is on our company that I've worked, now, worked for now for 40 years. I didn't know him very well. He was semi-retired uh, when I first joined the firm. Um, and when was that? Well, how did I come to work for Ray? Uh, well, I, briefly, I grew up in Plymouth and Cape Cod, not far from where Ray started sailing in Duxbury. My dad was a carpenter and sometimes a boat builder. And he made me a boat when I was about four or five years old, an eight-foot pram. And I started on the water young and always intended to do something with boats. It just seemed the natural thing to do. So when I was ready for college, naval architecture seemed like an appropriate pursuit. I liked to draw and I liked to build things as my dad did. Math, however, was not my strongest suit. So that part of the curriculum was a bit of a challenge. But I decided what do you use advanced calculus for anyways? But I enjoyed the creative part. Anyways, I got out. I f my first design job was with a big naval architecture firm up in Boston where we worked on Navy ships that were undergoing refits at the Charlestown Navy Yard. Probably some of you might remember that place. The pay was wonderful. I got paid a lot of money. I bought a sports car that year. Um, it always broke down when Carolyn was in it. <laughs> but the work was very boring, really boring. So aware of other design offices, in Boston, I went looking for another job. And I guess John Decknatel, Ray's partner at the time, uh, liked my drawings enough, uh, and he gave me a part-time job. That was 1967, a long time ago. I went full-time with them in 1970. And so after 42 years, I'm still doing it. It's still fun. And besides, I still need the money. <laughs> this is John, who was Intended to be here, but he's in Germany, as it turns out, on an, another museum trip of some sort. Ray lived on his farm in New Hampshire at that time, up in Tilton. And occasionally, he drove down to our office in Boston, which was on Long Wharf. Well, it started out on Lewis Wharf. We wound up on Long Wharf. He drove down to Boston in his big Lincoln with his dog every time. I gather Ray had a thing about Lincolns. He really liked Lincolns. He dropped in to design, discuss ideas, projects, designs. He was always dressed more or less like this. Uh, pop, top siders, white shirt, the sleeves rolled up, narrow black tie. Um, that was him. He was sort of a medium, medium sized guy, athletic, really the right proportion for a sailor to get around on a boat, not clumsy like me. As a young man, I understand he was first, a first-rate hockey player, and he, was, he turned down an invitation to play on the Olympic team. He always had some new ideas to discuss and would talk about them with enthusiasm endlessly. I mean, it would be 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, and he'd say, well, Ray, I'd like to go home. Well, he, he just would not let anything go. They were always interesting and sometimes a little weird. An example, he came in once, and here I was, the young kid in the office. He had a paper bag full of, I didn't know what, dumped it on my drawing board. It turned out to be leaves and seeds. And he spread them all out and he said, well, look at this one and look at this one and look at the way the shape is this and look at where the veins are. This is the way we should be making sails. This is where the batten should go. I wondered about this crazy old man, but he, that's the way he was. He observed these things. Another time he came down with a square baseball bat that he'd kind of hewn out of a log from the farm. He said, yeah, I mean, he knew I liked to play baseball. He thought, well, isn't this a better baseball bat? Because it's square. I said, well, you know, I don't want to use that, you know. But that was Ray solving a problem, what he perceived as a problem. At the time, I had a little O'Day sailboat, a little O'Day 20, not very big. Um, the family started to grow. Ray came down with sketches for an inflatable aft cabin. 
for my 20-foot sailboat. Um, I guess what he intended was that, you know, we'd sail to the harbor, drop the anchor, and then pff, I'd blow up this aft cabin, and we'd have a whole nother suite. Well, that's what I mean by what I knew about Ray. He was, he was that kind of guy, full of ideas. Marvelous thinker, you know, out of the box, uninhibited, you know, unafraid of what people would think. You know, if I thought of that idea, people, I'd say, people are going to laugh at me, so I'm not going to propose that. Not Ray. I've come to think that his genius, and I, I think he definitely can be called that, may well have been because he was not encumbered by too much formal education. I mean, a couple of years of prep school was all he had. No advanced calculus for him. And as much as we need education, I think it can be confining. You get told how to think, what's possible, what's impossible, and they give you a formula for everything. It's all very useful, but stifling. I think it's better sometimes to not know, so you try new things and new ways. And most of us would worry about being foolish or failure, but Ray went beyond all that. He had the confidence and the courage and the vision. I think all of those qualities we wish we had ourselves. Here's a, um, here's a, here's a picture. It's not a real picture, but I think it kind of, it's a, it, was, uh, it was a picture of Active. This is a boat that was in Newport for years and years. I don't know where Active is now. Uh, cruising, and there's a 12 meter behind it. It's not Easterner, it's um, number, I knew what it was. Thank you. It is American Eagle, number 21. Um, Bill Luters sent it to Ray and said, Ray, is this one of your designs? <laughs> and it could have been. It could have been. could have been. When, uh, when Sam Griffiths, famous, uh, the famous powerboat racer going way back to Dick Bertram's era, first saw Dick Bertram's 31 Moppy, he told Dick, he said, you better go stick a centerboard in that boat and go sailing. And if you peruse the hull lines you're going to see later of one of Ray's shoulder boats and then the, then the, then the DV, you might come to the same conclusion. They kind of look like sailboats. And Ray did put some centerboards in the powerboats for various reasons. But let's start, let's start back at the beginning. And I'm, I'm leaning here on an article written by Joe Gribbons in 1984 for a wonderful uh, publication called Nautical Quarterly. It's out of print. But this is a very nice history of Ray. And it was Joe who first called him the New England Archimedes. Somewhere. There we go. Quote Joe, he said, to call Ray Hunt an Archimedes does not seem wide of the mark. The Greek philosopher, physicist, inventor, and explainer of the principles of leverage, consumer of the laws of displacement of fluids while taking a bath, saw more clearly into the physical world than other men. And Ray Hunt was like that too. The New England sailor and designer was father or godfather to the Concordia yawls, the modern spinnaker, the midship cockpit sloop, and the light and fast 110s and 210s, an improved destroyer hull, and most significantly for the boating industry, the deep V hull and the tri-hulled Boston whaler. Nearly to the end of his life, he kept thinking and developing and had projects going. And who knows what was left unfinished. By any measure, an extraordinary man, quiet and sometimes quixotic amidst the creative ferment of his life, said Joe in 1984. So why call Ray, uh, New England Archimedes, it's an interesting caricature, don't you think? An original thinker with a stoic, practical Yankee side. That was Ray. And, hello. And that's Archimedes. <laughs> Ray, however, was a New Englander, uh, born in Somerville, 1908. He lived around Boston all his life. And he was the original thinker, like Archimedes here, who was credited with being the father of naval architecture due to his discovery of the principle of displacement while bathing. Picture Archie, and I'll bet all his friends called him Archie, about to drop into his tub on a sun-drenched Greek isle. And as Archie slides in, he noticed that the water level rises up. So he wonders what's happening here. He realizes his body is moving the water aside or displacing the water as he submerges. With a few quick calculations, he realizes the amount of water displaced equaled his own weight. 
You can try this at home. <laughs> and whether you like it or not, that'll be your weight when you're done with all the math. So a designer uses this very same simple calculation every time he approaches a boat design. And yes, some calculus is involved for accuracy. All boat design starts with this simple idea, at least if you want your boat to float, it does. And then, then it gets complicated. If you want your boat to float upright and so on, you've you got to get a little more specific. But Archimedes figured this out by observation. And Ray, I submit, had the same ability, and observation was his starting point. He could see to the heart of a problem. And so, so the question was, the question I thought of was, how did Ray become this kind of thinker? I don't think it's necessarily that easy to do. Certainly, but I, I don't know that I can say that. But we can look at the results of his creative mind and his waterman's life. So we're going to start where he started, in Duxbury. Ray sailed little boats in Duxbury, Mass, as a, as a boy. His grandfather, Cassius Hunt, was a Duxbury native who had built the original Duxbury Yacht Club on his property. They were a sailing family and a sail business family whose fish dealership, Cassius Hunt & Company, Founded in 1877, supported two generations of hunts. Sailing in Duxbury is an education in hydraulic flow, said Eric Olson, a sailor, a writer, an engineer, and friend of Ray for many years. Ray Hunt was an extraordinarily gifted sailor, and it is Olson's judgment that from 1922 to probably 1965 or 1970, he had to be one of the ten most outstanding helmsmen in the world. Hunt's very close touch with the water became apparent in the 1920s when he began sailing in the rarefied air of the Eastern Yacht Club in Marblehead. He led his Duxbury Yacht Club crew of juniors. And there's more to the Yacht Club here, excuse me. There we go. There's the Duxbury Yacht Club in the old days. Quite a place. He led his juniors to a victory in the Sears Cup in 1923. How about that crew? This was, this was standard sailing gear, I'm told. <laughs> this is Ray in the middle, and I've, I didn't bother to write the other folks down, but plus fours was, was standard. Uh, in 1924, they came in second, and in 1925, 1925, come on here, fellas. Here we go, 1925, they won again. I think it's interesting to see in two years how the dress code slipped. <laughs> <laughs> kind of getting sloppy already, huh? So he was, uh, he was 15 the first time he won that championship, which is today the Junior Sailing Championship of the U.S., Sears Cup. So he began to be sought out as a crew member and a clever yachting kid by leading figures in the Massachusetts Bay Yachting Establishment. He sailed our boats and Q boats in Marblehead, among them was a, uh, a boat called, a uh, Cuba called Hornet. If I can get this. Go over, come on there, fellas. Maybe I got a low battery here. You could have fastened Yeah. That may be easier. That's the Q boat. They certainly had beautiful boats to sail in those days. And then um, he bought what was thought to be an uncompetitive R boat from her designer, Frank Payne, and proceeded to beat the new R's including one sailed by Payne himself in what was then the principal arena for these boats. Frank Payne took an interest in this astute youngster and in 1929 was sent down to Oyster Bay with Payne's new eight-meter gypsy for the eliminations to uh, select the Sawanica Cup defender. Hunt and Gypsy were selected, and, and, but it made the committee nervous that this 21-year-old kid from, from Boston had been trouncing the best of the America's eights with a crew of three instead of five, and so they made him take on two extra hands. And then Gypsy lost the series by a narrow margin. Hunt told Yachting decades later that, quote, we could race that boat quite satisfactorily with three, and the two added crew had no experience in eights and never worked into our, our system at all. He also, uh, he also, oops, I beg your pardon, go back one. Sorry, these are probably sequenced, I'm sorry. This is Yankee, a big J-boat that he was crew and occasionally skipper of at the same time. So he was well sought after. 
that's for sure. And this slide sort of summarizes his early sailing success. And uh, I love this photograph, and that's what begat the title rock star sailor. I mean, he, the, the arrogance there is pretty, pretty strong, but, but, <laughs> but, but, but well earned, as you can see. So how did Ray Hunt go from this rock star young sailor guy to a designer and inventor of some of the most significant boats of our time? A couple of years at Andover was all the formal education he bothered with. He never got any university training in naval architecture or engineering. In the, uh, let's see, he's got a very handsome photograph here. We think, if I've got this right, this was about the time of Andover. Um, in the Depression years, when boat sales were not so great, he and other sailing types hung around the Boston design offices of Alden and Frank Payne and talked boats, often over seven cent lunches down at Durgan Park. Uh, I can remember when they were about seven bucks, and now they're probably about 27 bucks. Um, no doubt, uh, Ray absorbed, we think Ray absorbed a lot of the boat design business from Payne at this time. Uh, Walden, Waldo Howland was part of that crowd, and soon they were to form the Concordia Company. This is not 1920, obviously. He might have become a boat captain or a yacht broker. We hear he did well in the stock market, enough so that his uh, brokerage house offered him a job. And some say trading was a passion with him. But I think he had a desire to build and create things. His success as a sailor gave him great confidence. Uh, winning will do that. You win a lot, all of a sudden you think you're pretty good. And his life on the water gave him an innate understanding of how boats work. In 1932, he married Barbara Dean from Cohasset and started a family. And that is certainly a sure-fired way to focus a man's mind and energy on work. <laughs> and here they are. This is not a wedding photograph. Uh, I call this the Body and Clyde picture, because they, to me, look like they're up to no good. <laughs> His first break in, big break in design came in 1938, when Wellen Howland gave him and Waldo the task to design a new cruising boat and the Concordia Yawl was born. In a last gasp of yachting before the war in 1938, Ray won the Royal Bermuda Yacht Club's Challenge Cup in a chartered six meter. And in a pattern that he maintained his entire career, he had many projects going one at a time, going at one time. And the radical 110 appeared at that time before World War II interrupted everything. The war years found Ray in Cohasset, where he was a chief bosun's mate in the Coast Guard, and I have some more family photos here, which give you a taste of him, Ray, and his family. This is uh, on Zara, I believe, that they sailed a great deal all over the place. Here they are in the Bahamas. Can you imagine Jim Hunt as a teenager? <laughs> there you go. And here's the whole family that looks a little better. You have uh, Diana, Jim, Ray, Barbara, Josh, and Kate. Wholesome looking, I think. After the war, um, the return to civilian life brought a surge in yachting and boat building. Ray moved to Marblehead and the sailing center, really, of the Northeast, and formed a partnership with a young sailmaker named Ted Hood. Here's the letterhead from that period. I love the very long phone numbers. <laughs> they were designing boats, building boats, chartering boats, selling boats, anything, and making the sales for them, of course. And together, it was at this time that they developed the modern spinnaker that we use today. Um, this was a, a, a triumvirate that often sailed together quite a lot. Ted, Ray, and Brad Noyes. His pace accelerated even faster after 1950, and he really achieved his, his greatest successes and disappointments over the next 15 years. 
The chronology of it all is a little hard to follow because he snapped back and forth between powerboats and sailboats and back to powerboats again. So I'm going to take it design by design and start with the uh, relatively unorthodox tens. A lot of people know about one tens and two tens, but there were a whole string of them. They really were. The 23 foot one ten began as an experiment in the use of plywood in the 1930s. Ray was experimenting with plywood in his Cohasset workshop, according to some of his friends like Dick Fisher, uh, Boston Whaler. The challenge was how to make a cheap race boat this, without this new wonderful material. The Fisher Pierce Company built the first few before the war and then Lollies and some others put it into production. And, and the 110s, as you probably, as those of you know, they're flat bottom plywood coffins, they were called. And certainly on Buzzards Bay, they were submarines. They would go out, get full of water and get dragged back. I remember when I worked at the Yacht Club in, in Marion, they'd come back to the dock and the kids were soaking wet and the boats were floating right down and we'd have to pump them out. Not a good boat for Buzzards Bay. Later on came the 210. Well, here's, oh, I, I, I really like this sort of retro brochure cover. This is from that period, sort of a classic. The 210 class, another one of those. The 210 class came along, and it was a little bit sexier version of the 110. It had nicer ends to it um, and more canoe shaped sections. This is a series of brochures. You can see that it had a lot of longevity. There was a drier boat. It was bigger, obviously, so it was a little bit drier. There's its profile. But the simplicity of these things is quite remarkable. Um, very unusual. There's an older one under sail. 105. And there's the lines plan <coughs> drawn by Fenwick Williams, who was one of Ray's draftsmen from Marblehead. And Fenwick was a character, I'm told, um, half very nearsighted apparently, and his mother supposedly wouldn't let him wear glasses. The story was the only way Fenwick could see a drawing was to pass it by like this, sort of scan it. But the drawings he made were absolutely wonderful. But you can see that this, this is pretty unusual stuff, but very simple to the point. Pretty neat. Later on came uh, the 410, which is just a larger version, 36 footer, a little more shapely, and another sailing success for Ray. In 1948, Etois won the New London Marblehead race by two hours. According to Jim, who sailed with, with Ray, uh, the race committee thought they had cheated and gone through the Cape Cod Canal. <laughs> but in those days, you had to sign in at both ends and sign out at the other end of the canal. So they checked, and no, they didn't go through the canal. They went around Cape Cod. Later that summer, they won the Edgartown Regatta. Here is the 45 foot 510, very similar to the 210, but a much bigger boat. This is a drawing that we did at, at Hunt Associates a few years ago, probably more than I remember now, uh, an updated version of it, but the, the lines are still the same. Um, and um, I'd like to read a comment that John Decknatel wrote about a description of it, uh, just to, to sort of put it in context. Today, uh, a boat like this would be, would be termed a ULDB, Ultra Light Displacement, or as a um, boat builder friend of ours in the old days called them balloons on a stick. <laughs> that was Alan Weitzies. Probably some of you knew Alan Weitzies. Um, she's an extension of the concept of the 110, although it's more like a two. Uh, Ray preferred the 110 type late in later years, and he thought that the plum ends were more functional. But the 210, 510 type was developed really for aesthetic reasons, to soften the looks and, and make the boat drier. The 510 typifies some of Ray's design concepts. Low wetted area with a separate rudder and skeg, 
and with a bulb fin keel. And very good form stability for the beam. A 1010 project, a boat of a roughly 12 meter size, was stifled due to poor tank test results that Ray really didn't believe. Um, in fact, the story goes that Ray noticed that when the boat went down the tank backwards, it, it had less resistance than forwards. <laughs> Which caused Ray to wonder why we didn't turn the keels around. But that never quite happened. Um, in later years, it would prove that he, Ray would be proved right uh, when they recalibrated the leeway predictions and so on. And, uh, and once again, Ray seemed to be ahead of his time. The, the, um, in 1949, and here's, here's the boat that was built. There was only one built. That's Ray sailing Barbara. And Ray and Barbara, his wife, sailed that boat in, on the New York Yacht Club cruise when they beat the, big, the biggest boat in the fleet, Baruna, 72-footer, with a paid professional crew, et cetera, et cetera. Just the two of them beat them boat for boat. And today, of course, 110 and 210 fleets are still sailing all over the place. Um, and somebody today needs to build another 510. That would be a wonderful thing. Go see our website. There's one on it. Now, for something a little different, the Concordia's. Ray and Waldo Howland had designed and built several boats together before the 39 and 41 foot yawls were conceived. And they did not intend this design to be anything more than one boat for Waldo's father. But in the end, a hundred were built, or more. And most are still alive today. They are treasured like fine furniture. And I swear there are owners who just like to look at them on their moorings. And I can't pretend to know every detail about these boats. Oops, I'm using my microphone here. Um, okay, got it. Certainly there are people that know much more about the Concordias than I do, and I, and I couldn't do justice to, to talking about them in any great detail. But in any case, the Concordia Yawl was a huge success and has achieved a Hall of Fame status among sailing yachts. And if you haven't seen it, you need to go see the magnificent model upstairs that was built this boat. The time that went into the model, you could have built a real boat, for sure. <laughs> for Waldo, the Concordia was to be merely an extension, as he put it, of a modest and comfortable New England home with natural knotty pine and locust interiors, corduroy fabrics, and white paint. For Ray, well, he gave it his usual balanced hull shapes and no distortions for any racing rule, but of course, it was a successful racer, and it did a lot of winning, including Bermuda, the Bermuda race in 1954, Cow's Week in 1955, Halifax in 1955, New London, Annapolis 1955, Annapolis, Newport 1957, and New Bermuda again in 1978. And then there were so many first in class victories and cup after cup after cup. The, the major Ray Hunt Concordia victory uh, this is the sail plan, obviously. This is Ray's boat, Harrier. Ray and his family picked up this 41-foot sloop at the builder's yard in Germany in 1955 and sailed it through Holland and across the channel to Cowes. With the family as crew, they won six out of six races at Cowes Week. And they, <coughs> excuse me, and they were leading the fast net rake race <coughs> when a turnbuckle let go, costing them that race. The Brits went crazy about the boat with a family crew. All the attention somewhat unnerved Ray, as I'm told. He was basically shy, uh, and, he, and, he, and he avoided it, avoided the publicity. They gave out cash prizes in those days, but Ray was afraid that that would hurt his amateur status. So he persuaded the race committee to give him a clock barometer trophy instead. And this is the plaque from that trophy. And all those firsts, you know, that's quite something. <laughs> um, 
Imagine winning six out of six races. I don't think anybody's done it before or since. I mean, it's a, that's bigger than the Red Sox in 04. <laughs> well, maybe. I don't know. They had to wait 86 years. Ray was better than that. Ray had many more victories than Harrier. Note that uh, Harrier was a sloop, not a yawl. And Ray just did not think much of the yawl rig, even though it had its advantage under the old CCA rule. Later, he tried a cat rig. He was always trying something. Another sailing uh, sailboat uh, design of his, which, I mean, we're switching gears here. It, it, the, the shoulders, these were called. And they're almost like they were designed as a counterpoint to the tens. Now, the tens were shallow, light, with big, deep keels. The shoulders were heavy, deep, with no keel. They were all center borders. Many of them had uh, center cockpits, which was unusual for the time. There were 30, 40 footers, a few bigger ones were built, not too many. But look at the lines plan and look how simple it is and how symmetrical it is and how pretty it is. It took advantage of the CCA rule uh, that gave an awful lot of advantage to uh, shoal draft and center borders, which we found out years later with the O'Day Company, actually. They were still using much the same. John uh, Decretel wrote this comment about Scholars. He said, one of Ray Hunt's Scholar series of cruising racing sailboats, the 38, is characteristic. Centerboard, low wetted area, high displacement to suit the CCA rule. The Shoal Draft delivers a low rating and permits shoal, shoal, shoal water cruising. I mean, it was a wonderful, wonderful thing for the time. It has very low wetted area and a modern separated rudder, which was unusual for that period. There's no keel appendage. And in this, uh, as he says, the shoulders were precursors of later Ted Hood designs. Stability is a result of high displacement with ballast, a fair extension of the canoe form. Some of the shoulders actually had transom sterns. Most of Ted Hood's, the famous Robins, were as a result of this, this, this basic design. But again, think of the tens and then think of this boat. And you think, well, where was this man's mind at? I mean, most designers are stuck in a, uh, in a rut. Certainly, Ray was not. Now, for something a little different. <laughs> the Boston Whaler, the venerable Boston Whaler. In the mid-1950s, Dick Fisher conceived the idea of a balsa wood pram to be light and unsinkable. He thought that would be popular. And then he discovered foam and fiberglass. But he wanted to build a, an improved sailfish design. Ray suggested to him, and they were pals, that he go to an outboard boat because it was a bit much bigger market. So they, they, they agreed to try that. Ray first sketched an idea, a uh, version of the old Hickman sea sled, which, uh, if you're not familiar with that, was kind of like an inverted V, it had kind of a catamaran, but with a big section in the middle. They were very, very stable, but the ride was horrible. Um, so Ray added a center hull, and they, then he added another, they refined it, and they added another one. They went through various iterations, they find it. They finally got the, uh, the whaler hull, which you see there, to, to work acceptably well. Meanwhile, Dick was messing about with the phone and process, and eventually he kind of got that right, more or less, and the Boston whaler was born. The process never quite got entirely right, and many, many semi-cooked whalers found their way to the Fall River landfill, I'm told. <laughs> but by any measure, the whaler, the Boston whaler, and I wonder why it wasn't called the New Bedford whaler? I mean, where did they get the Boston whaler thing from? I don't know. That'd be an <laughs> I'd like to know that. It was a huge success, and, and Ray did see a reward for his part in it from Dick for years. <clears throat> they paid Ray royalties on the design until Whaler was bought by a bunch of B-school types who decided they'd paid him enough and they kind of weaseled out of the deal. But I won't mention any names. You might know them. <laughs> Ray never endorsed the larger tri-hull Whalers, the 17 Montauk, very popular boat. He thought by 16 feet uh, you should go back to a V-hull and get a better ride. But with a Whaler, certainly Ray can be credited with the creation of a whole genre of modern small boats with his tri-hull concept. 
just another day at the office, or in the case, Ray's case, a day out of the office. Uh, Ray had his disappointments. Probably two major disappointments in his career. The first was Easterner, the 12 meter design done for the America's Cup Challenge in 1958. One of the handsomest 12s ever launched. She showed power and speed on occasion, but never really performed consistently well. Cartoon from the Boston newspapers. She had a full cruising interior while the other 12s were already on the path of being stripped out racing boats that have become standard today. Also, it was a Corinthian run operation the Noyes family had, uh, perhaps a little less intense than other teams, I don't know. Ray occasionally sailed the boat himself, but perhaps not enough. We're kind of left to wonder what might have been had he sailed some more. There was one race <clears throat> on the New York Yacht Club cruise in 1962 on Buzzards Bay, which you can relate to probably, when the 12s Columbia, Weatherly, and Nefertiti were battling it out in a light westerly. Ray and Easterner were badly beaten. But Ray took Easterner way up under Nauchon and high of the finish line, which was off the Cuddy Hunk buoy at the time. The westerly died, and the 12s all sat there going nowhere. And then a southerly filled in. Guess where? <laughs> Off the islands first, right? And Ray sailed home to take the Astor Cup an hour ahead of everybody else. Uh, it was a great example of Ray's ability to know where to go on the race course, or just when he's on the sea, he knows where to be. He could never explain this. He just knows. He just knows, I've heard from friends and family and, and writ and, and read about it. It's a phrase I've heard over and over and over. To, to, to describe Ray's uncanny, uncanny sailing prowess. He just seemed to know where to go. But failure was followed by great success. These are 5.5 meters. This is Minotaur. He, he designed a nice boat in 1956, Quixotic, which he drew for Ted Hood and McNamara purportedly another one of these designs in the back of an envelope. Clearly a fast boat, but, only, but unfortunately a rigging failure kept it out of the Olympics. But he made up for this with Minotaur here, number 26, uh, in 1960, which was an even faster design, which George O'Day with Jim, as, Jim Hunt, son as crew, they sailed to the gold medal in Naples against the best of the world. And according to Jim, Minotaur could slide right by other boats in light air. John Decknatel had this comment about the Minotaur design. And there's the hull lines for Minotaur. It looks fast, doesn't it? It's a very slippery looking, pretty lines plan. The 5.5 Minotaur is a perfect example of Ray's ability to pick the most important characteristic, ignore the rest, and produce a conceptually unique boat. For the 1960 Olympics, Ray designed Minotaur for light air in Naples. He took the basic profile, the hull and keel, of 5.5s of the late 50s, which he had no quarrel with, and produced a very slack, narrow waterline hull. With very fine ends and low wetted area, which was smart for light air. From a rule point of view, he went to a maximum sail area, maximum length, and maximum displacement. Minotaur had the lowest wetted area of any 5.5 produ hull produced up to that point by a substantial margin. And Ray felt that that was very important. Wetted area, sail area ratio for you techno guys, he felt was much more important in light air racing than sail area displacement ratio. Minotaur was to prove a breakthrough. And Minotaur won the Olympics with relative ease and clearly unbeatable boat speed. And you can see from the, the lovely undistorted shape here, and there were some strange 5.5s drawn. Minotaur was particularly outstanding in waves to windward, uh, and the hull form proved to be a far greater performance range uh, than, than the tank test once again said. Ray didn't believe him. She was just another intuitive Ray Hunt design. There's a newspaper article. They don't really write newspaper articles about sailing anymore, not like these. 
have Jim Hunt on the left and George O'Day on the right. And Jim, who's in the middle? Thank you. And this is the gold medal. Not really that big, but <laughs> still it's a... In 1963, he, well, after Minotaur's success, of course, he had um, commissions for 5.5s kind of poured in. It wasn't a huge market, but it was a prestigious one. It, in 1963, he designed a boat called Kaya 2 for a Finnish boat builder named UC Nemes. That's what you see here. Hmm. The races were about to begin down in Oyster Bay when UC got word his boatyard had had a big fire and he had to go home. He asked Ray to take over the boat, but Ray had never raced a five and a half meter before. He jumped on the boat, and guess what? <laughs> After five races, of which he won two out of the five, he had a 900 point lead over competitors, like Albert Fay, who was top five and a half race, George O'Day, and Prince Harold of Norway, among about 25 odd boats or more. He was so far ahead after five races that he sat out the sixth race because he said it was really nasty out there. <laughs> the rest sailed that last race for runners up honors. The New York Times called him the, quote, the bespectacled grandfather from Tilton, New Hampshire. And when, when you look at the roster, as I did recently, just putting this together, and the New York Times articles where they wrote lots of stories in those days about sailing, which, do they do that anymore? Um, the, the, the roster of designers and, and sailors and the boats that he beat was amazing. Europeans' absolute best, and, and Sparkling Stevens' boats were way down at the bottom, and Looter's boats, and Brit Chance was just beginning, and his boat, you know, barely got off the beach, and Ray's boats were just right up at the top. It's quite remarkable. And then, of course, he changed gears. Now for something completely different. This was what Ray called a hunt form. And he was designing these boats pre-war, during World War II, and after World War II. Isn't that a, isn't that a beautiful photograph? I mean, in the, in the water, and the boat, and it's lovely. These were low dead rise boats, low speed planing hulls they, for the power that was available in those days, and it wasn't a lot. Uh, they had distinct bell shaped sections forward, which you'll see in, in a minute. Um, they're sort of typical of the boats of the time. They were not unusual, but he was, he was evolving something, you could see it. Uh, they were quite efficient if you kept the weight, the weight of the boat down. But, um, that's true of most boats. In any event, a good number of hunt forms were built from about 20 to 40 feet by Graves up in Marblehead and other folks. And I want in particular the Hunt Yachts folks that are here to take note of the third paragraph of this ad in 1948. If you can't read it, it says, the hulls of these boats are stock. The superstructure, interior, and propulsion are custom built to your needs and specifications. Some things never change, right? <laughs> How far we've come in 65 years. So Ray was building and selling boats as well as designing them. So uh, we thought we had a good idea. Well, it wasn't particularly new in any case. After the war, a lot of high horsepower engines became available. This is a boat called Sea Blitz. It was designed by Ray for the Noyes family around a 1500 horse V12 Packard engine war surplus. It went 50 miles an hour or more. I've heard as much as 60. Um, I find that tough, but I've had trouble making boats go that fast. Maybe that's why. Uh, it was probably limited only by available propellers. Uh, in those days, they weren't very, they weren't as, weren't as nice as we have propellers today. But anyways, it was quite the boat and must have scared an awful lot of people half to death. Now I'm going to show you the process. Here's the hunt form. There is Sea Blitz 
And there is a boat called Gypsy Girl, but it's a typical deep V offshore race boat. Look at those hulls, and you can see the evolution of Ray's thinking about motorboats. You can see how the hunt form at the top with its bell-shaped forward sections, and then things got straighter and straighter as it went. A lot of work was being done by the Navy during the war to develop better seaplane hulls, and those hulls took a beating, needless to say, and uh, leaked badly. Well, a lot of them sank is what happened, because they pound the rivets right out of them. So they were after a better hull shape for seaplanes, and Dan Savitsky, remember him, I mentioned him way back in the beginning, working for the Navy, discovered that bell-shaped sections actually had lower impact than V-shaped sections. Doesn't sound intuitive, but it, they, that's what they proved. Who knows, it might have involved advanced calculus, I'm not sure. But he published this data, and perhaps Ray was influenced by some of this work. Now look at the, just go down and look at the deep V at the bottom, and look at, look at how the V runs all the way aft. And up the top, how it was flatter. It's a nice evolution. I think at some point, Ray broke through the conventional thinking of the time, which was really represented by the hunt form, that fa fast, to, no boat to be fast, you had to have a flat stern. And he saw that he could carry the V all the way aft if he kept the buttocks straight. Now, we, most of us don't have straight buttocks. <laughs> and <laughs> boats, but, but you want to have a fast boat, you better have straight buttocks. This is, this is a buttock. It's a line, I'm sorry for the shakes, but it runs, it's a slice through the boat longitudinally, and there it is. And it's running uphill here. See it going back uphill. Here, with sea blitz, you can see it's pretty straight. It's almost parallel to the keel, isn't it? And here, it's absolutely parallel to the keel. And, and that's the key. That's the key. It doesn't matter how much dead rise you've got in the back, or in the middle, or whatever. But if your buttocks are straight, you can make the boats go fast. I don't know how he figured that out, but he definitely did. And it was against the flow of what was going on at that time. Note the addition of the lift, what we call lift strips. These strakes, spray strakes, whatever you want to call them. Um, they don't show up in profile, I'm sorry, but they show up here. Um, that was an addition that he came up with, and I'm not sure how. Um, they have multiple functions and a major, purport, a major uh, feature of the boats that really make the boats work. They clear the water off the hull, as you might imagine. They make it dry. They add lift. It's pretty simple stuff. They add a dynamic stability that keeps the boat steady on the water. They reduce redded surface. They do a whole bunch of things um, that he must have figured out or it was a good thing, obviously. I'm amazed today when I see fast boats without them. I don't, when they're created by people who should know better, in my opinion. And my friend Dan Savitsky thinks so, too. The, the cool thing is, one of the cool things, and I get a little nerdy here, I apologize. The simple dihedral angle of the bottom is, the, is really the key to it all. It, it gives the boat a better ride, because it's sharper, of course, uh, and more dynamic stability, really because of the same reason that an airplane has di dihedral in its wings. When you look out the window of any airplane that you're going to fly on, mostly the wings go up. That's a stable shape. The only airplanes that have horizontal wings are the ones that are incredibly maneuverable, like fighter planes and so forth, and you can barely fly the things. How much of this theory Ray grasped, I don't know. But boy, he, knew how, he, he sure how, showed that it worked well. And today, after 50 years, really, the same basic shapes of that bottom lines plan are still in use on the fastest offshore boats. And no one has come up with a, a better shape for speed in rough water that is as simple and as reliable and as practical as Ray's deep V. I mean, you've got hovercraft, hydrofoils, catamarans, trimarans, all kinds of things. But they're expensive, or they're fragile, or, or they really only work in certain circumstances. The deep V is universally useful and practical. OK, enough of the nerdy stuff. Here's, here was one of the early deep Vs, probably built right here in uh, the New Bedford area, a little glass boat. 
The first one was built by the Whartons in Jamestown, Rhode Island. Dyer built some more after that, and they showed up at the America's Cup in 1958. Dick Bertram noticed. And he had Ray build design, and he built the 30-footer, which became the Bertram 31, and the first one was known as Moppy, named after his wife. That was her nickname. And it's a pretty familiar story, I know, today. But here's Carlton Mitchell's account from Sports Illustrated in 1960. Carlton Mitchell went along to write the story of the Miami-Nassau race, and he went on Dick's boat. He said, in government cut, the water lay smooth. And aboard Dick Bertram's moppy, I was slammed back into my chair as Sam Griffith gunned the engines. The fleet dropped a start in the wake, stretched like a fat, fat, a wide road back towards our nearest competitors, a road that grew steadily longer. Dick and I looked at each other in amazement as the gap opened. We grinned. We had believed other boats would be faster in calm waters and based our victory hopes on the performance of our V-stern hunt design in the heavy seas on the open ocean in the Bahama Bank. But Moppy was taking them in the calm water inside the cut. In the Gulf Stream, in the steep, confused seas, Moppy came into her own. With minutes, within minutes, the feet, fleet had dwindled to dots wreathed in spray, long before the skyline of Miami Beach dropped below the horizon. The other boats were out of sight. Eight hours later, to the minute, we roared past the finish line off Coral Harbor. Aqua Hunter, another hunt DV, was second, two hours later. The rest of the fleet, those that weren't forced out by the rough seas, finished the next day. <laughs> in 160 miles of grueling punishment, the roughest race in the history at that time, Moppy had set a new world record. And with it, the Bertram Yacht Company was born. This is the iconic Bertram 31. Um, they built thousands. They tried to put it out of production and they had to bring it back. And then out in the boondocks, they really are sought after. For the 40th anniversary of Boating Magazine, that was the boat that they picked as the greatest boat of our time. And truly, because of its influence, absolutely, no question. It is. I mentioned earlier that Ray had two great disappointments in his career. The first was Easterner and was followed by huge successes in the five and a half meters. Then the victory with the Bertram race boats and all that year after year. So the second dis disappointment I had to, to, I think had to have been much worse for him. He filed for and received a patent on the deep V hull. And the royalties rolled in. Then someone discovered an article in the Skipper magazine published over a year prior to the filing. And under the concept of prior disclosure, Ray's patent was overturned. That was the article. Although it did not diminish the magnitude of the creation of the deep V, which was really a total paradigm shift for powerboats, it certainly limited the financial rewards he was due. But the design commissions kept coming, and a variety of boats were designed and detailed by Ray and his disciples. This is Stingray, 56-footer built by um, the Whartons, again. Um, I saw it uh, just a few weeks ago at the Palm Beach Boat Show. It's sort of painted an icky light yellow. But it's under about its third refit. It's beautiful. And it's for sale, of course. It was done over recently by the Brooklyn Boat Yard, and they did a lovely job. This was drawn by Fenwick Williams, the nearsighted boat designer. Um, other disciples. Um, who drew, drew boats following that, um, like this one, Momiji, uh, Bertram International, built in Japan out of wood, uh, drawn by John Decknatel, uh, Ted Burgess, Mark Ellis, you might know Mark from another boat design, Charlie Janis, um, all excellent designers, and a crew that still goes to work every day. Uh, Peter Boyce, Steve Weld, Craig O'Bara, Bob Provincial, they all did some beautiful work. And, and some of the drawings for these boats are exquisite. 
It would make a lovely exhibit, Jim. <laughs> you could use somebody else's drawings too, but we'll give you a lot. <laughs> this is Gypsy Girl. This is built for Max Aiken, Sir Max Aiken, who was the son of Lord Beaverbrook. Max was a uh, Spitfire pilot and a newspaper man, and he liked fast boats, both power and sail. He had a hunt sailboat too. This boat wound up supposedly smuggling cigarettes from Gibraltar or from Morocco to Gibraltar. That was it. That's what happens when you, the old race boats. There's some miscellaneous projects here, which it tells you, again, Ray's creative mind never stopped. This is a fast offshore lobster boat to get to the, to the, to the, to the offshore lobster population, which was, wasn't just, oh, people weren't aware of that until the 60s. Uh, a preacher lobsterman named Bill Whipple from Marblehead originally and then Westport, he came to Ray in the early 60s to give him a faster lobster boat than the traditional boat because they had to go so far offshore. So it was one of Ray's deep bees, built by Alan Vices over in Mattapoisett. Cruised at about 20 knots, with one big Detroit diesel in it. And to improve on the process of setting strings of traps in deep water, they developed the first open transom that became standard on lobster boats ever since. I love this cartoon. It's from the old National uh, Maine Coast fisherman in those days, Dud Sinker. The deep V lobster boat never really caught on here because lobstermen like these two guys on the right over here um, are very traditional bound. Um, but down in Australia, the deep V lobster boats are standard equipment. Now here's a real Ray thing, trailer boats. <laughs> it's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> and it's another result of observation. Have you ever watched your dinghy when you've towed it? Sure, we all have. But I'll re bet Ray did and thought, what happens if I go faster? And then I go faster. So then he started towing around a whole boat behind another boat. And if one works, well, why not two? Ray was never afraid of making prototypes, and somehow, somewhere, he found the money, or spent somebody's money, and he did it. At some, this is pretty remarkable stuff. At some speeds, the trailer boat would actually push the tow boat as it rode down the stern wave. It's a, kind of an early Prius, right? Rumor is he had some CIA money funding the project. They had some boats they wanted to tow around extra fuel tanks with and then with explosive bolts or something blow them off and go off and do whatever they were doing. Um, not too much came of it. Bill Whipple did, did build one and used one for taking lobster pot traps out to the deep waters um, and lost one at sea. I took the idea back to uh, Special Operations down, Command down in Tampa a couple of years ago uh, and got an audience with a couple of SEAL types to say, hey, wouldn't this be a cool idea for you? And they kind of liked it, but they didn't have any money. Um, so we need some investors or we need our congressional delegation that claims they don't do earmarks to get, get us an earmark and we'll build some. Here's the cat rig on uh, Harrier. How are we doing? Um, the, the race, there's enough topics with Ray's to go on forever. He liked to play with that. Um, it, in the latter years, he, he teamed up with Phil Weld. You probably, some of you know who Phil Weld was. Um, and that's a, quite a pair of, Yan of Yankees. When they go, those two guys got together in the office, that was a little odd. Phil wanted to do the O-Star single-handed transatlantic race in a multi-hull and then take the outboard hulls off of his trimaran and sail the mono hull around the world in another race. I can't remember which one it was. Do you remember, Peter? Don't remember. You did most of the drawings, I know. Um, so Ray's idea was for a cat-rigged, mast aft, quadrilateral jib on a 110, I mean a 1010 hull, now we're talking a 70-foot 110, and then a couple of regular 110s as the other part of the trimaran. 
Well, why not? It sounded like a one where he said, well, it never happened. Mostly due to a couple of strong personalities, Ray and Phil. R Phil ultimately won the 1980 O-Star in a Dick Newick design try called Moxie. Probably you remember that. And right to the end, Ray was working with other projects. Water ballast was a big thing with Ray. Uh, he tried it both in sailboats and motorboats. Good idea. There's a lot. When you're on a boat, you got a lot of water around, so why not? So, what is Ray Hunt's legacy? God, it's a lot, isn't it? An amazing record of sailing success. Uh, the beautiful Concordias, the tens, 110 to 1010, uh, the modern Spinnaker, the world champion five and a half meters, the Boston Whaler, and the Deep V, the really big one. I mean, what an incredible varied product of a life in, in boat design. I mean, virtually every small powerboat today, from 10 feet to 100 feet, is a result of <coughs> Ray's designing. <coughs> I can't think of any designer has success like that. And when I look back <coughs> on my career, I think the one of the best days of my life was when I walked into 54 Lewis Wharf and asked for a job. And they got me one. So that's really the story of Ray Hunt. A little, this little, little Surf 125, and I know some of you folks have got one of these, is sort of the epitome of his boats today. There's no better boat on Buzzards Bay than that little 25-footer. Um, I can stop here, or I can show you some more uh, product of our uh, work after Ray, if you will. Go for it. I love this picture of Ray. It's hard to find a, one of him smiling. Did you notice? There was one back in the Bahamas. But here he is. I like that one. So in Hunt Design, um, we've taken Ray's basic concept. I mean, we're not nearly anywhere near as creative as Ray. We take the deep V and we turn it into what our customers want. Here's a partial list of our clients. You'll uh, recognize names there for sure. These are production boat builders for the most part, some custom boat builders. We even have one client now in Abu Dhabi, Emotion Marine. We designed a boat for them, it's called a Voodoo. <laughs> this is a Rabalo, this is the very first Rabalo. They built a whole co boat company around, around this. this was the, I put this here because this is what Ray would have thought that the larger whalers should have been. Relatively low dead rise, aft, sharp forward. <coughs> this is uh, an East Bay 38, which is kind of an iconic boat these days. It was really the first of what I call the blue boats that were, or the, or the conservative, I mean, the magazines call them down east boats, which I hate as a, as a handle, but um, high performance uh, sort of Yankee boats. And we've done all the East Bay designs. We've done all the Grady White designs for years and years and years, and it's very typical of the production boat business. Nice people at Grady White. They pay their bills promptly. <laughs> uh, Hunt Yachts, yes, another boat company with Ray's name on it. Uh, we started this company in 1998. Uh, John and I, I persuaded John it was a good idea. I, I don't know, it's a midlife crisis. I claim that sometimes, sometimes temporary insanity. Um, we started with Concordia here in, in South Dartmouth and, and Ray Hunt II, known as Racy. Um, he was, he was uh, there at the beginning and is still with us as our chief engineer. Um, unlike his grandfather, he's a detail guy. His grandfather was a bunch of, Ray keeps us going with the details. Um, so we've been doing this for a while now. Uh, here's a custom boat um, built by Lyman Morse for a sculptor in Maine called Whist Whistler. It's twin water jets, typical of sort of the smaller custom boats that we do a lot of. Uh, here's a boat built by Royal Houseman Shipyard in Holland, probably the, one of the nicest boat yards in the world and builders. Not a very big boat for them, only 63, 64 feet long. Very pretty, built for the owner's 
one of the owners of uh, Holland America Lines. Here's a similar boat, the 67 footer built by the Hinkley Company. Um, believe it or not, this is a Hinkley, but the Royal Houseman boat costs twice as much. Here's a 72 footer um, built by Berger for Richard Mellon. Um, classic, I, li I like it um, just for its sort of classic lines. It was to be a kind of a kind of a recreation of his father's boat, General Mellon's boat. Here's a 100 footer plus, a little bit larger than 100 foot, called Electra, built by Lyman Morse. Also, uh, all composite boat. Uh, about 4,000 horsepower, 30 plus knots. Lives in Miami. Doesn't look like it, but lives in Miami. That was built, it's one of those newer process boats with infused construction where they pump, pump all the resin in at once. And if you don't get that right, you got a 100 foot, take it to the dumper. Here's a boat that's not exactly our style, but it's got our bottom on it. It was built by Palmer Johnson. It's called Mostro. It was built for the owner of Monster.com, thus, thus the name. About 5,400 horsepower uh, and twin water jets. Now I kind of get into the, the part of the boat application of raised deep Vs that really, um, I think, bring out the best of the deep V. These are pilot boats um, that we've designed for a lot of pilots organizations, built locally here in Somerset by Gladding Hearn Shipbuilding. It really puts the deep V to work and shows its qualities. These boats go out in any weather, 24-7, 365, snow, rain, ice, they have heated decks, heated handrails, heated windows. They never stop. And they are all over the country. That's where Ray's concepts have gone to work. And we got more in the process right now. It's been good business. Here's the one, 75-footer uh, at Charleston. The other thing besides coping with rough water, they are very steady alongside a ship, which is real important if you're gonna climb that ladder. Here's a fireboat we did for the U.S. Army, 75-footer, water jets also, pumps a lot of water. It's to fight fires at one of their ammunition depots down in North Carolina. 11-meter uh, rib designed originally for the SEALs um, and built by the U.S. Navy as a general purpose boat. That picture was taken in the middle of the North Atlantic in February. It was cold out there. Uh, this, fun, uh, this is sort of fun uh, because this is a 86-foot patrol boat we did in the 1980 period uh, for a company in Thailand. It was all composite. It had um, some exotic Isota Frascini diesels. Never heard of them before. Uh, Castoli water jets. <coughs> uh, it had to be approved by some classification society, ABS or Bureau Veritas or somebody. Nobody in those days knew how to handle composite construction. We got the drawing back from uh, Bureau Veritas in Paris, I think it was, and they had drawn over our construction plans wooden frames on one-foot centers. <laughs> we said, no, 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 we can't do that. <laughs> so we kind of taught them how we, we kind of taught them how to build fiberglass boats. Um, don't know too much about it because it went to Thailand or they built them in Thailand, I should say. But later on, we learned that the Israelis kind of borrowed the design. And, uh, and they're very serious about patrolling their coastline. And they built a lot of these to, to do just that. But we don't know anything about it. Except the Israelis tried to sell some to the US Navy. That's how I heard about it. Here's a boat that we designed for the US Navy, built for and operated by the US Coast Guard. These boats are built by Gladding Hearn also. They're 65 feet long and have water jets and do about 30 knots and are armored uh, and armed. And they are 
intended to escort our nuclear ballistic missile submarines to sea. They're, the Navy perceived as a threat to those boats carrying the missiles that they carry, and so they uh, escort everyone to and from the docks. And don't, get, don't let anybody get anywhere near them. There are a dozen of these built. We'd like to sell the Navy some more. And this is one of my favorite photographs, and I'll wrap it up with this. This was at, in, on the beach in Haiti after the uh, earthquake, when our Navy went in and did a lot of relief. And uh, to the left is a Sea Ark built, 34-foot standard Navy coastal patrol boat, and on the, on the right is an 11-meter rib. So we've really put Ray Hunt's concept to work. That's basically what we've done, and it does work. That's my story. <laughs> Thank you.